So it's been several months since I've done my unboxing and preview of the Ender 5 Plus. And when I did that review, I told you I would come back and do a full review of this printer so that I gave you my final thoughts on the total package here. Well, I've given the printer some time and I've even given the community some time to give their feedback on this printer. And so in this video, I'm gonna give you the full rundown of the Ender 5 Plus. I'm gonna tell you what I found about it, what the community has found about it, and then I'm gonna give you my final recommendation right here on Cozy Fabrications. Let's go. So first of all, let's talk about the specs of this printer. Obviously the big appeal of the Ender 5 Plus is it's a bigger printer over the Ender 5 and of course the Ender 5 Plus. The print volume on this printer is gonna be 350 by 350 by 400, which is a lot bigger than the 220 by 220 bed on the other printer. The total volume, like the amount of space this printer is gonna take up, is gonna be 632 by 666 by 619 millimeters. Uh, for people that use the English or Imperial system, it's gonna be about two foot cubed if you're looking at how much space am I going to need to actually hold this printer. The other big appeal of this printer, due to the large bed, they've gone with dual Z screws here. These are four millimeter lead screws, uh, which means that the four millimeter lead is gonna be similar to the two millimeter lead screws that I used in the Ender 5 upgrade video. So you're not going to have to worry about this bed falling like you did on the original Ender 5 and Ender 5 Pro. So uh, people are gonna love that really because the dual Z screws is gonna keep this printer bed sturdy. Uh, the whole construction around this print bed uh, from the aluminum extrusions that actually hold the bed in place, the nice large springs and screws that allow you to level the bed, all of that's really sturdy. And you're not gonna to have to worry about the bed dipping like some people have had problems on the Ender 5. It's just gonna be a much more stable print surface. One thing, and I've noticed this, is that I've never had to readjust the height on these Z screws. So they stop where they're supposed to stop. They start again when they're supposed to start. I've had no skipping on them. And so it just, it provides a much more stable print environment uh, so that you're not adjusting between prints. The electronics in this printer are not the same as that you're gonna find in the regular Ender 5 or Ender 5 Pro. The electronics are here are similar to the CR10. Uh, it's got a dual Z screw uh, main board. It has uh, A4988 drivers. It's a very loud main board, which you heard in that original preview video. You're not going to want this around a living space where you're going to have to listen to it because it's going to be a lot of squealing. Uh, we're going to talk about how you can fix that in later videos. The specs just give you what Creality specs are on it. It's They're specking the hot end up to 260 and the bed up to 110. I can tell you from experience, I don't think you're gonna have any problems getting this bed up to 110. I think the 260 on the hot end though is going to be a little hot, uh, particularly since you have a standard Bowden tube that is going all the way to that hot end. It's not an all metal hot end, which means if you get that, um, that standard PTFE tube up above say 245 or so, you're really gonna have some problems, particularly if you have small animals in your houses or just in general, you could really start breaking down that PTFE tube. So again, with all of these standard uh, stock hot ends that you're going to get from Crowley printers, I think you're going to be maxing out about 245, which let's be honest, that's going to get you PLAs, ABS, that's going to get you even into some of the lower temp PTFEs without any problems. Next up, let's talk about assembly. The assembly of this printer, as you saw in my preview, it's not very difficult. It is a little bit more work due to the dual Z's um, and the fact that you have to assemble this whole bed assembly. It's a little bit more work than what you're going to see uh, for the standard Ender 5 or the Ender 5 Pro. I don't think though that you're gonna have, uh, even if you're not super mechanically inclined, it comes in large pieces overall. And the instruction book uh, that you're gonna find, the manual that it comes with, does walk you through that whole thing. I had no problems following the manual, which I always do in my build videos. And so there was um, no problem at all getting this thing assembled. Just talking again about the manual, the there's no real use information in the manual. It's mainly assembly. There's a little stuff in it about getting started, 
um, but you're probably going to rely on more videos like this one or the preview video or some more basic 3D printing videos to get you started. If you're wondering about cable management overall, they really do kind of leave it to you. There's no real instructions on how to handle the cable management here. If you watch my original video, you'll see how I have things cable. I think it works well overall. I haven't really, even though it looks like it a little bit, I haven't had any problems with this dragging the bed. And there is actually a mod that you will find on Thingiverse to hold up some of these cables and keep them off your print. So uh, cable routing, not a huge issue. Uh, most of the cables are long enough if you wanna strap them to other parts of the printer just to get them out of the way. Uh, I've got this cable which holds all the main wires to the hot end strapped over here. It really does a good job of just staying with it. So no problems with the cable routing. So what do I think about the overall construction of this printer? Well, I've had no problems with the construction of it due to the fact that there are so many pieces keeping this sturdy uh, from the screws that are holding on the top um, to the screws that hold on the bottom. And then you have some additional bracing thanks to these big Z members that hold uh, the bed. There's real no construction or flex issues. Uh, the only complaint that I had during the construction or looking at the materials used is that they replaced the original Ender 5 corner braces with plastic ones. The original Ender 5 ones they were great braces, so I don't know why they decided to replace them with plastic ones. Well, I probably do know. These are probably cheaper. But the only thing I can say about it is there's really no flex here still due to the uh, um, number of other components holding this printer together. The corner braces are more for holding the shape than they are for really uh, necessary for really keeping the thing uh, square. So I really haven't had any problems. I do wish that they were metal. You could still replace them with some metal corner braces. But like I said, overall, no real problem. Now let's talk about the auto leveling of this printer. So the auto leveling is one of the main features that people will see this out of the box. They go, look, it comes with the BL Touch out of the box. That means it's got great auto leveling. I'm gonna have no problems with this printer. Well, that's where we kind of have to put on the brakes because it's not all it's cracked up to be. The real issue is not the BL Touch. I love the BL Touch. I put it on other printers. I've had no problems with it in the past. Um, what you're really going to have a problem with the BL Touch on this particular printer is the firmware. So the firmware as of this video still does not quite handle the BL Touch correctly. It still doesn't have a correct offset like I talked about in my original preview. What that means is, is it is not doing an offset from the print head, the tip of the print head. It should do an offset because that's where you're gonna be printing. It's not doing that. It means that there's an offset to the whole build mesh that you're gonna have, which is really not accurate to the print surface. Now, in reality, hopefully, you're not going to actually have any problems with that. I haven't had any problems with that. We're only talking about being off you know, uh, what are we talking about? Maybe 30, 40 centimeters. It sounds like a lot, but due to the way that these beds typically curve, they have some pretty standard curves to them. I don't think you're gonna have problems. Like I said, I haven't seen problems. In fact, since this comes with a glass bed, um, it's still going to be pretty flat. And that's what I found. I have printed on this printer with the auto leveling completely turned off with no problems. In fact, I had such problems with the, um, way that they implemented auto leveling to begin with that's actually how i printed a number of my first prints i just turned it off the glass was flat enough i had no problems so keep that in mind um, they still the firmware's not quite right and hopefully in a future video i'm going to show you some open source alternatives to this firmware which will allow you to use the bl touch correctly uh, again it does have manual and auto uh, leveling built into the touch screen so if you want to level it first with the manual method, then with auto leveling, that's what I did. That's what I did in my preview video. That's what I recommend. And then you can determine whether the auto leveling is helpful, whether it's not necessary, or whether you're going to have to do some mods later to fix it. In the menus, you will find that there is an auto level switch. And what that switch does is it turns off whether it auto levels every single time. So it's up to you. Some people want the auto leveling on every single time. Uh, some of it, some people don't. And what that does, it causes the firmware to insert the auto leveling so you don't have to include it in your G-code. 
Whether that's useful or not, it's up to you because obviously you can put a G29 in your start G code, it would do the exact same thing. So I just wanted to mention that's what that switch does in the firmware. So moving from the top, let's go to the bottom of the printer. Let's talk about the electronics that come in this printer. As I mentioned in the very beginning of this video, this is a similar board to what I believe is on the CR10. So it has a dual Z splitter on the board. It does not have separate drivers for the Z. It has A4988 drivers. That I like the A4988 drivers. They're powerful, but they're really noisy. And at this point, there are a lot better drivers on the market. Don't get me wrong. I am glad they did these over the DRV8825s, I think because those are the ones that you always have to add the smoothers to because they have a known issue with creating that salmon skin and you don't have that problem with the A4988s but you do have a lot of noise. Another good thing they have a dedicated MOSFET for the heated bed which is really nice because this uh, large print bed can pull a lot of juice so you don't have to worry about any damage to your main board. Uh, the main board controls the, uh, the on and off signal that will go to that heated bed but it doesn't actually have to control the amount of juice flowing into it. That's what the MOSFET does. On the software that's actually on here, obviously we're running a modified version of Marlin. It's still a 1X Marlin variety. And one of the big problems and big complaints I'm gonna have as a big fan of open source is that as of this video, they have still not open sourced the firmware for this printer. So we don't really know if there's any major changes that you need to worry about or anything that you know, you might want to include if you tried to build custom firmware. Also, the display itself, the firmware is not open source. And while technically, if they built that firmware from scratch, they don't have to include the source. It would be really nice because there are some things that could be added to this display that would make it a lot more useful. And I wish that it had some more features. So if you open source that, the community can then take it. They can mod it. They can add more features to it. It's just better for everybody. Last but not least, let's talk about the power supply. So the power supply, they've st stuck with the Chang Lang, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, power supply. And this is one we've seen in other printers from them and from other manufacturers. It's a low cost Chinese power supply. I'm sure that's why they switched from it from the Meanwell, which was a more expensive power supply. Uh, it's important to note that TH3D did a video where they noted that in their printer, the power supply was not properly grounded. That's both a safety concern and is a concern for some of the electronics that will not work properly without a common ground. So I'll link over to their video so that you can see what they did. And I'm gonna switch right here to checking out this printer to see if it had the same problem. So in Tim's video, he demonstrated that his power supply that he had in his Ender 5 Plus did not have a proper ground that went from this plug here, which is the ground wire from the wall, uh, through the chassis of the power supply into the chassis of the printer. So what we're going to do here is we're going to see if this power supply in my printer has the same issue. So first of all, I do not have the power connector attached from the wall. A safety issue, go ahead and leave that disconnected. You don't need it to test this. Because all we're doing, we're going to have the multimeter set on continuity mode that will beep when we have continuity between the two leads. Next up, we can actually, we're gonna attach the black lead or the red lead, it doesn't matter, to the green wire, the screw going to the green wire. And then we can check anywhere on a uncoated part of the power supply to see if there's continuity to that ground. So if I look, for example, inside these holes where they've been cut, there shouldn't be a coating. And as you hear, we have uh, no problems at all with the continuity from here to here. If we want to double check something, we can also check the continuity to the chassis by using one of these uncoated screw holes. And as you can hear again, continuity check passes. This power supply is safe uh, because we will have contact from the chassis all the way to the ground of the, the house or the structure that you're in. So there we go. So as you can see, I didn't have any of those problems. Mine seems grounded correctly, so mine's safe. Uh, what can I say about that right now? Well, I haven't heard of this being widespread. I've heard of some people having it. That's what made him check on it. Um, so if 
you're worried about safety, when you pull out, when you get this printer, pull off the bottom, do the simple check that I showed you in that little clip, and you can make sure that your power supply is properly grounded. A lot of people have turned to immediately replacing this power supply with a mean well right out of the box. That's up to you too. Me personally, it's grounded, it's safe. I haven't had any smoke come out of this printer. So until it does, I'm gonna go with the, the Cheng Lang that it comes with. It's not giving me any problems. But if I ever need to replace it, you can get mean wells easily from Amazon. I include a link in the description so that you can find that power supply. Looking at the display, there's one feature I really wanted to point out beyond just the standard menus that, that are available to you. There is a setting once you've started printing called economy mode. This setting is just a bad idea. From what I can tell, the only thing economy mode does is shut off the print bed after you've stopped started uh, your print. Don't know why you'd want to do that because what that's going to do is it's going to cool down this wonderful glass bed which is going to make your print pop off the print bed as soon as it reaches a certain temperature. Again, I don't know why you'd want to do that. I don't know what function it'd have. Obviously, if you wanted to do that, you could do it in your G-code just like you could with that uh, auto level mode. So, don't know why they have the economy mode. I recommend turning it off as soon as you start your first print because that economy mode is going to mess you up. You're going to be like, why are my, my prints coming off the bed? That's probably the first thing you should check if you're having adhesion issues, particularly if it's not adhering maybe you know a couple of minutes after the print begins because it's going to heat up to 60. Everything's going to heat well. And then, you know, five, 10 minutes into it when it cuts off that bed, it's going to just pop right off and you're going to be frustrated. So keep that in mind. So while we're talking about electronics, let's talk about the safety of this printer. Uh, when we talk about the safety of the 3D printers, one of the main things we're going to be talking about is something called thermal overrun protection. And what that keeps us from doing is overheating the hot end or the print bed and having the thermal runaway. Because if we have thermal runaway on this printer, we could cause a fire. It could either be an electrical fire from the, the wires getting too hot, or it could be possibly a fire with your material, although that's less likely, but it could happen. We care about all these things. We don't want any of it burning up. So obviously I checked this printer. I wanted to know, are we gonna have those problems? And I tested two different scenarios. Number one, I tested what happens if it was no longer able to supply power to the bed or the hot end. The other one I tested, well, what happens if one of your thermistors is inaccurate or comes undone? So testing both of those, both of those succeeded. If I pulled one of the thermistors while it was supposed to be heating, it immediately fails. It immediately drops out and says, your thermistor is wrong. Those settings aren't correct. I'm going to stop heating. You need to shut off your printer and fix it. The other one, which is where I disconnect the heating element from either the hot end or the bed. Once I disconnect those, obviously it's no longer pushing power. So if it's not pushing power correctly, something is wrong electrically. And same thing, I got the thermal runaway protection on the screen. It's a different error on the screen, as you can see, but uh, it passed both of those tests. Uh, as far as other safety concerns, it's kind of nice that this printer, much like the other Ender 5s, is a full box enclosure. The bed is not moving quickly. You know, the only thing you've got moving is the top. So as far as safety concerns, if you have little kids around, obviously things are still hot. There's no enclosure. You can still burn yourself if you're touching the wrong parts. Uh, the only thing you could really hurt yourself on uh, from the movement would be if your hair or something got caught in the movement. But, you know, those are probably things you're going to have on any open air printer like this where you don't have a full enclosure. Just keep that in mind. Uh, keep safety first if you have little ones around, pets around, that kind of thing. But other than that, this printer overall is as safe as any with this open air setup. So while we're talking about electronics, let's also talk about a few of the other components. So the filament sensor. Now, some people are really against filament sensors. They don't think that they work. They think they're unreliable. My experience with this printer is the filament sensor has been terrific. I haven't had any problems with false detections or uh, creating really any problems about the filament path. Uh, I've had it actually work for me a couple of times, which I believe I showed in my previous video. Uh, in fact, the only thing I could say about it, it creates a little drag on your filament, which could be a little bit extra pressure on your extruder, but again, no problems here so far with that. Uh, the only problem really is that due to the way that they've got it oriented on this single metal plate on the back is it 
really is sometimes when you run out of filament, it's hard to get your old filament out. Now the way I've been doing it is I pull off the clip, pull out the uh, tube, and then you can pull it out that way. That seems to work. But there's no real easy way to pull it out like underneath here after the detection's occurred. So just keep in that in mind that you may have to pull it apart. The other thing to keep in mind about this filament sensor, or I guess it's more to do with the firmware, when the filament runs out, you kind of need to be ready for that to happen. Otherwise, it's going to cool down your hotbed. And as we talked about with the economy mode, that's a bad thing. You don't want it to cool down your hotbed when that happens because then your print's going to pop off. It's going to mess you up. So if you are using the filament sensor, be prepared. Know when approximately your filament's going to uh, run out. Be nearby so that you can turn everything back on and uh, keep going without any cool down of your hotbed. Now, I've already spent a little time talking about the touchscreen, but I wanted to make a couple more notes about it. So the touchscreen. I have a love-hate with touchscreens. So as we saw on like my AlphaWise printer that I re reviewed before, that was a terrific touchscreen. Had a lot of features, it was easy to use, it made it where people that didn't even really know how to use this printer in particular could go up to it pause it, no problems at all. This printer provides that kind of basic functionality. It provides a printer that you can go up to, you can pop in the stick and, and start printing. Uh, of course, there, there's some gotchas with it though. First of all, the file names need to be shorter than a certain number of characters. So if you put in uh, a newly sliced G code and it doesn't show up, it probably just means that the file name's too long. Um, my biggest gripe as even even the most moderate power user is going to find when they start using this printer is you're not going to find any settings in your firmware. Uh, the only thing you're going to find are things to do with leveling, like the, the Z height adjustment and stuff like that, some micro stepping. It does have that to where I can change the micro steps of my Z height after I start printing, which is terrific. But for example, if I want to change the E steps of the extruder, if I want to change the uh, number of steps of the X and Y axis, that kind of thing doesn't provide that via the menus. Uh, if I need to change any acceleration settings or any of those sort of defaults you may want to get access to, you're going to have to use your USB connection and a prompt interface or some sort of terminal application to talk directly to the firmware because that's not available on the firmware as of this video. So keep that in mind. Uh, while some people find the dial and everything cumbersome, it's sometimes really nice because at least Marlin has taken the time to put all of the settings in those very basic uh, LCD sort of displays where the touchscreens have to be programmed to do all of that, and this printer hasn't done that yet. The print surface. So the print surfaces this comes with is a, like I said earlier, it's a beautiful glass bed. Uh, mine is pretty flat. It's not perfect. It dips a little bit in the center, but not enough to where it, there's even an issue printing it uh, with just the manual leveling. leveling. I'm still not having any problems. Uh, you're going to find that this uh, surface has two sides to it. One, it's got the smooth glass finish, and it's got a more matte finish on the other side. Now, I think they intend for you to print on the matte finish. I've heard of people using that side. I didn't like that finish. Uh, first of all, mine wasn't completely flat. Mine had some divots and stuff in it, uh, as well as uh, I saw that it would be really easy to scratch and damage, and that didn't appeal to me at all of ending up with a print bed with a damaged side to it. So I'm a glass printer anyway. I use mirrors. I've shown you that in other videos that I've done. And so I've used the smooth side. Do what I always do. I wash this with hot water, Dawn detergent, paper towels, either drip dry or paper towel dry when you're done to keep the lint off and then never touch it with your hands. I've had zero problems with the smooth glass side of this. If you need extra adhesion, glue sticks work fine, hairspray works fine, or some of the more exotic coatings that you can get for this, that will all stick to glass just, you know, just as well and give you some extra adhesion. Now let's move on to some of the test prints. Now, I included some of the nicer test prints that I was working on in my first preview video, and I've done a few smaller prints since then and another larger print just to kind of find out what the consistency of the printer is. So let's talk about 
stringing first because that is kind of an issue on this printer. Obviously, with such a large print bed, you end up with a large Bowden tube, or excuse me, a long Bowden tube. And because of that long Bowden tube, uh, you are going to get a little wiggle with this default tube. So uh, when I was running various stringing tests, which I have here in front of me, I give you a close-up up. It was difficult to get rid of all of the stringing with the default tube this ships with. Now I could get rid of them all for the most part, 99% of them on uh, some of my uh, purely stringing test prints. But then when it came to actually printing uh, some things like this, uh, T-Rex skull here, this Terminator T-Rex skull, I still got stringing at various parts, particularly on tips of things like on teeth and uh, some of the mechanical parts of this. Uh, it wasn't horrible. These are pretty easy to clean up because they're very wispy, uh, but that's about all I could get it. Um, I'm going to show you uh, some close-ups of this Mythosaur skull that I printed. Uh, again, all the links to these, if you want to print these yourself, I will give you links to where some of these are free on Thingiverse, some of these are pay, but I'll send you links to them. And I uh, couldn't get rid of all of the stringing using this tube. Again, this video focuses on what does it do out of the box. We will have future videos where I show you how to fix some of the things that I'm complaining about in this video. But as you can see with this skull, cleanup was really easy. Once I did all the cleanup on it, it's, it's a really nice print. And uh, some of the artifacts that are still on it, like some of the uh, zits that you see on here, um, are actually slicer potentially issues and not actually issues with that stringing problem that I, that I was talking about before. Layer consistency, just as before, uh, when I showed you the print results on my Mandalorian helmet, which was in my original video, Layer consistency is terrific on this printer. I'm not having any issues with flexing or bowing or the wheels, you know, moving around uh, inconsistently. Uh, I'm going to show you some close-ups of these, and they the consistency looks great. Now, on any printer, and I'm going to show you this on this T-Rex skull, there can be some banding. And to work out what is the printer's fault, what is your slicer's fault, that can be very difficult. So again, I'm going to give it a solid A, uh, A minus maybe on layer consistency. It looks just really good. And I mean, there are some specific areas that I can pick out where, you know, it's not perfect. But overall, layer consistency was really good on all of these prints. Um, the only thing I really saw, see, I printed this terrific model that you can find on my mini factory. And this is the Veiled Lady. And all the way up through this print, all the way up to the face, the print is just about flawless. I mean, it just, the layer consistency is terrific. The overhangs are great. I, I really had no problems with this until I got pretty high up and I start seeing some weird banding on the face, primarily on the face, a little bit on the neck. Um, and... I have a theory on this one. I'm going to hash it out in a future video because I haven't had a chance to do it yet. But on this print, since I was printing so large, I had a lot of supports on this print. Um, I used Z-Hop. Now, this is a big bed, and you know Z-Hopping is moving a large bed. I think that's what I'm seeing here, and I can back that up a little bit with this. I don't know if you can hear that, but these uh, nuts that are on my Z screws are unfortunately not the tightest in the world. There's no anti-backlash on these and they're not made of a palm material that could be a little bit tighter. And so there's a little bit of movement here. And so I believe that's what I'm seeing on this. It's an easy thing to fix. Like I said, I'm gonna cover it in a future video. It's easy to replace these with um, anti-backlash nuts like I did on the Ender 5 regular printer and that's really going to take care of I believe some of that bounce some of that layer inconsistency I'm seeing here and obviously the other solution would be not to use Z-Hop and that's going to require a little bit more tweaking of the printer because obviously you don't want to mess up your prints by not using Z-Hop but it is a large bed and maybe Z-Hop's not the best idea but I'm glad I tested it 
it did uh, show one potential problem and you might want to avoid it. So the last test prints I want to mention are these calibration cubes from my original video. If you saw that video, you'll remember I printed the big one in the center and the small ones on each corner to verify that across the bed I was getting accurate prints and that there wasn't any sort of, you know, uh, change in dimensions as you got towards the edges or towards the center or anything. And in that video I showed that right off the bed, these were just about perfect. I may have pushed my calipers a bit hard, but it really doesn't change the fact that these are pretty accurate within probably a few thousandths, maybe a hundredth, but really, really close to what you'd expect and without any extra modification to the printer. Usually you have to adjust the steps a little, the slicer a little, depending on where you like to make your changes. But for this printer, I didn't have to make any adjustments. These turned out just great off the printer. So the last section before I get to the summary is I wanna sort of talk about what the community has seen in this printer. I follow a lot of the boards. I get messages directly from you guys, which I love either as a comment, sometimes as an email, sometimes a direct message on various social media platforms. I always accept those. I do my best to handle as many of those as I can. Um, but what have I heard from people on here? I will say overwhelmingly, people have solved their problems that they had with this printer, either through firmware updates, like I've already covered in a previous video, or just from learning how to use this printer properly. They've gotten through these issues. Now, what kind of issues have people have? Um, usually, kind of like I was saying earlier, usually the issues that they've had have been uh, usually around the auto leveling or around firmware issues. They've had problems getting it leveling correctly um, getting it that initial setup done right so that they get good clean adhesion once they get that set up correctly everything's working right now I have seen some occasions where people have had some weird issues I don't think the issues such as I'm getting weird banding I'm getting uh, this um, artifact that I can't seem to get rid of uh, Crowley doesn't know I'm not able to help them that kind of thing is going to happen with some printers. I put that out there because not all of these problems are easy to fix. There could be firmware issues that affect, you know, one weird uh, one-off printer for some reason. There could be, you know, one mechanical issue that is making that printer not print well. Keep in mind, uh, you're going to have that problem with all sorts of printers. Uh, I'm not excusing this printer. Please don't take it like making an excuse for it. But uh, overall, I think that people have been able to work through most of their issues, at least the ones that I've talked to. So if you get this printer, if you have some issues like that, if you are seeing uh, things that don't make sense to you, things that you don't know how to work through because either you're relatively new to 3D printing or you just haven't encountered those issues before, feel free to reach out to the community. Um, from what I've heard, Crowley does their very best to help out people that are having problems. Uh, their support seems to only get better from the people I've talked to. And uh, I've been real happy where, uh, when I've reached out to Creality and said, hey, this person's having a problem, can you help them? Uh, they've, they've jumped right on it and uh, they've done a good job so far. So reach to the community, reach to Creality. I think you can get through most of the issues here. Uh, obviously, not speaking for everyone. Some people have had issues that they haven't worked through um, and uh, I don't want to dismiss those, but almost all printers, particularly sort of the budget modder printer uh, you know, they're going to have some of those issues. Now we're at the end of this video where I want to kind of give you a summary of everything I've discussed so far and um, then give you my final verdict. Now I'm going to read this summary because I want to make sure I hit all of the points and I don't have a teleprompter set up. So I want to walk you through kind of my overall impressions of this printer. The bigger print volume is excellent on this printer. Uh, it's suitable for helmets, busts, things like that. Things you can't do with one of the smaller printers uh, like the Ender 3s, the standard Ender 5s, things like that. So if that's something you want to print, I very much recommend this printer. I recommend it uh, probably. Uh, it may not be easier to use for some people than something like a CR10, a CR10S, but I'm pretty confident the quality on this printer is going to be as good or better than those printers. Uh, I like the glass print bed by default. That's a good choice from them. I like that better than, than their standard um, sort of plasticky um, build tack sort of surface. Uh, as I mentioned, there are some potential problems with the power supply, the electronics that you may run into. 
Some of the electronic problems can be solved with a firmware flash. Um, uh, there are alternative boards for this in terms of uh, making them quieter, making, making it potentially run better. Um, the firmware is not perfect. They haven't open sourced yet. That's a huge issue for me. I wish that they would hurry up, open source this printer. There's really no reason not to. I mean, after all, it's Marlin. All of the other printers run Marlin. We have sourced for those printers. As I mentioned earlier, the touchscreen leaves a lot to be desired. Uh, it's one of my least favorite touchscreens I've used on a printer mainly because it only offers, uh, beyond leveling and the leveling features it offers, everything else is very basic. Uh, so it'll print, it'll heat, it'll move, but if you want to tweak anything, that's not in there. You're going to have to hook it up to a com uh, computer. Uh, I think I've mentioned once or twice, this printer is loud out of the box. Don't forget that. It's a A4988 drivers are loud. As I mentioned, there are some solutions for that I'm going to cover uh, in a later video. Um, let's see, uh, you're going to have to upgrade the Capricorn tubing almost immediately. I haven't done it yet because I really wanted to keep this review stock. Capricorn tubing is going to save you, or Capricorn, let me mention, that's not the only brand. Uh, TH3D, um, Printed Solid, I think, uh, the, the, a lot of the different, Filament One, they all offer sort of a different version of that, but Capricorn is obviously the name brand. It's the one that I put on my printers up until this point. Uh, you're going to have to upgrade that almost immediately to get rid of um, hopefully all of your stringing. I don't think you're going to have a problem if you upgrade the tubing. So I think in summary, what I want to say, I've put together a final verdict. This is a great platform. It has a large print volume, huge potential for modders. There are some electronics issues that you're going to run into on this printer, uh, as I just discussed. Uh, firmware, this touchscreen issues I mentioned. Um, for me, you know, I, you know, as I mentioned in my preview and build video, it printed great out of the box. I had no quality issues. Uh, I may even produce another video where I just walk through basic out of the box setup so that you guys have something to follow. Here's what I would do. In fact, I just remembered Creality has already done that. So if you want to follow a link, I'll give you a link to Creality's video where he, uh, Ben over Crea at Creality has already made such a video. Maybe I'll add one too. Um, because I think it's a relatively simple process, but I do think it's a process that if you don't follow the right sequence of steps, you're definitely going to have a problem because uh, it's not going to be done in the right order. And even though it's easy, you, you may skip a step and that's, that's going to be a real problem for you. So who would I recommend this printer to? First of all, modders. So if you want a printer that is going to give you something terrific and functional out of the box, this one works. This is a good printer out of the box, meaning it does print well out of the box, which, I mean, step one, does it print well? Yes, it does print well. Now, this is a terrific platform, in my opinion, for modders. It gives you a huge surface area. It is a box printer, which gives you a lot of places to mount stuff to. It gives you a really large electronics enclosure for you to put all of your different pieces in that you're going to be adding to it. Um, that's going to be terrific. It's going to be less boxes added to the side. Um, and obviously, with all of this space, I could even put different extruders on it. I could use the Bowden or I could use a direct drive on here. It's a very sturdy platform, as we found out with the traditional Ender 5 printer. Um, so, you know, a lot of this, there's not a lot of flexibility. There's just a lot of rigidity to it, which is just going to make this an overall great platform for putting different components on it. So what if this is your first printer? Do I still recommend this to someone that's relatively new to 3D printing? Well, I will say yes, but with a caveat. That caveat is you need to be patient with this printer. Because as I mentioned, if you do everything in the right sequence right out of the box, either following Ben's instructions, following my preview video, or if I publish another video, if you follow those instructions, you could have a terrific time. It could work right out of the box. It could start printing up. Uh, I've, I've read, you know, similar comments from other people like this was my first printer. I've had no problems printing. Uh, thanks for the recommendation. But I've had other people like this is frustrating me. I'm going to just get rid of it and buy something easier. So if you're new to 3D printing and this is your first printer, make sure you're willing to learn. Make sure you're not expecting a $2,000 printer out of this because it's not. It's going to require some tweaking. It's going to require a little bit of tuning to get it just right. So. If you feel like, hey, 
I'm good with electronics, I'm good with mechanical stuff, that kind of thing, and I think I'll enjoy this as a hobby, particularly modding stuff, get this printer, it's gonna be a great platform for you. So full disclosure of this review, Crowdy provided no direct payment for this review, they provided the printer. Uh, other than that, this opinion was completely mine. I tried to be as fair as I could with this. One of the reasons I waited so long is I wanted to make sure I got community feedback as to how this printer was working for people. Like I said, I think the overall experience has been uh, good for this printer. A lot of people are going to comment on some of the issues that I've already been over, as well as maybe they have some personal experiences that they'd like to share. Again, that's what the comment's for. Feel free to use them for that purpose. If you have any additional questions for me, again, comments, you can direct message me. But I do like them in the comments because that allows other people to read your questions and for me to reply to them once there. So let's wrap this all up. I want to say thank you to everyone for watching this video. Thank you for being a subscriber to this video. If you're not subscribing, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell icon so that you get notified when I come out with future videos. So what is next on this channel? Well, finally got the full review done. That means modding time. You're gonna get my mod videos for this video, similar to what you've already seen me do for the Ender 5. I'm gonna start with the Ender 5 Plus. Uh, the first video out of the gate is going to be uh, the, my top five mods for this. And I'm gonna just go and get those out of the way in one quick video because I want you uh, to be able to hit the ground running with this printer if you get one uh, after I've posted this review. So obviously uh, you'll see a link to that at the end of this video if I've, if I've already posted and you're watching this later. Otherwise, I hope to have that out as soon as possible uh, so that you guys can see what I am going to do first to my Ender 5 Plus. So now that we're at the end of this video, let's talk about, hey, new studio space. Yeah, same space, uh, updated camera, updated lights, uh, some backdrop here. So I hope you like what I've done with the place. Uh, and I'm going to do my best to crank out some better looking videos and uh, hopefully over time some more videos. That's my goal here. Thanks to your support with the affiliate links down below. That's the easy way for you because that doesn't cost you anything extra if you want to support me on Patreon. Uh, or there's just a simple PayPal link in the description if you want to contribute. None of that is required. Just thanks for watching. Hit a like on this video if you've made it this far because we're at the end. Thanks for watching. I'm Chris. This has been Curzy Fabrications. Bye, everybody.